Hello again, everyone. Welcome back to Timeless Testimonies. So I was just doing a little bit of reading earlier in the testimonies. I'm in volume four, and I started a few years ago just from the very beginning of the testimonies for the church. I realized, you know what? I was raised up in the Adventist church, and I have never read through the testimonies for the church. I've read them, portions of them, but I've never really read them for what they were. They were writings, sequential, in, you know, progressive time by Ellen White with a purpose, and that purpose tells a story. So it's really been a blessing. I just mentioned that to kind of preliminarily encourage you to do the same thing and see how you benefit from that, because Ellen White talks about how the testimonies are unread and unappreciated, and that they contain principles that, if carried out in the life, will have a transforming effect on our character and fit us for the society of heaven. And so, while I was reading today, I was really burdened. You know, I've been very burdened for a while. There's a lot of, of kind of riding the fence in the Christian experience. You know, if you've ever had a desire to overcome sin, if you've, if you've ever felt uncomfortable with sin in your life, but you find yourself still sinning, then you're going to be able to relate to this idea of indecision. You know, you want to be a full Christian, and yet you find yourself living life in a way that you recognize is just unchristlike. It's it's not in harmony with the principles of love. So there's this riding the fence, this indecision, and I was struck by this statement. And I'm about to read it, but when I read this statement, I thought, oh man, I just have to do a short video on this. Then it led me to another section in the testimonies, and I want to include that as well. It's still not going to be super long. It's not going to be one of my longest videos, but it's going to be more than a five-minute video. So I'm going to start off in volume four, reading from page 344. And this is in a testimony called Self-Caring Ministers. And again, like I said, it was just the next testimony that I was in order to read as I'm going through the testimonies for the church. And I was just really uh, moved by this. So here's what Ellen White has to say. Indecision soon becomes decision in the wrong direction. Many decide to serve themselves and Satan by not making determined efforts to overcome their defects of character. While many are petting sinful propensities, expecting to be overcomers sometime, they are deciding for perdition. Now, the rest of it's really good, too, but I just want to kind of focus on that for just a moment. You know, notice here that she makes a very important statement that indecision becomes decision in the wrong direction. You can't remain undecided. You can't remain inactive. You can't remain a passive bystander. I want to stop and, and say this. I'm about to give um, an illustration, and I want you to really pay attention to this because this is something that anybody can recognize as wrong. The same principle applies in just our day-to-day -day life experience, how we choose to live, how we choose to think, how we treat others. Okay, so if you were to come upon someone who was being physically abused, like you're literally right there, let's just say it's a child, okay? Because anybody can recognize that it's wrong to beat a child should be easy to recognize that it's wrong to beat anyone, but, you know, most people can really um, relate to this, okay? So you see an adult, they're beating a child, the child is black and blue, maybe bleeding. I mean, it's just awful. If you were to just walk by and not do anything, you would basically be participating in that abuse because you didn't do anything to stop it. Now, that is inaction. That's being kind of undecided as to, oh, should I, should I step in? Should I not? Should I step in? You know, would I get hurt? Uh, 
you know, what are going to be the repercussions of that? Well, you're undecided, and then that indecision leads to a decision in the wrong direction by just, oh, well, I haven't been able to make up my mind to do something positive here, so I'm just going to walk by. That's a choice. That's a decision to do something wrong. Now, apply that same principle just to every other activity in life, every other situation in life where you're faced with a choice to do right or do wrong. And then if you're undecided, am I going to give in to the temptation to do wrong in the situation or not? Am I going to make a choice to do the right? And if you're undecided too long, that will lead to a decision in the wrong direction. And so the purpose of this video is just to kind of bring that out to your awareness and to encourage everyone to not let that happen. Don't let that be your experience. Don't remain undecided so long that there comes a point where you actually make a decision in the wrong direction. Now, just because I don't want to just kind of leave it out there with, oh, you know, if you remain undecided, you could end up making a decision in the wrong direction. While that's definitely true and it needs to be treated with the importance that it deserves, there is always encouragement. So now I want to turn to, let's see, what page is this? 614 in Volume 4 of the Testimonies. This is um, beginning in paragraph 2. So here's what she writes. The weak man may become strong, the timid may become brave, and the irresolute and undecided may become men of quick and firm decision when they feel that God considers them of sufficient consequence to accept their labors. Okay, so I'll just pause real briefly. Just, you know, it's so good to contemplate what's being read. Are you really digesting it? Are you really internalizing it and self-examining? So, you know, if you feel like you're weak, and hopefully we all recognize our own weakness, but you should also recognize that with that weakness, there's the potential for strength. There's the potential to not be timid anymore, but to be brave, to do things that make you uncomfortable. And if you have a tendency to be irresolute, or undecided, you can become a person who is able to be quick with their decisions, to be firm in principle. This is also very important. She explains that in order to do those things, in order to have that transformation, it will come about when we feel that God considers us of sufficient consequence to accept our labors. Because that's a lot of times what holds people back. They don't feel like they have anything to offer. Oh, you know, what can I do? Man, you can do a lot. And how do you know what you can do if you don't even try? You know, until you try to do something, you may not recognize what you're really capable of doing. So take that step and find out what you're capable of doing and recognize that God wants your labors. He accepts your labors and do whatever is in your power to do, whatever talents you have. You don't have to do the same job that everyone else does. Some people are called to be evangelists. Some people are called to be ministers. Some people are called to be teachers. Some people are called to be musicians. Some people are called to be writers. I mean, there's all kinds of ways to minister for people. And don't let anybody tell you it has to be done a certain way. God has given each one of us talents. And you know what your talents are. You know that everyone has a talent. And if you think that you don't have a talent, well then, hey, start asking people if they think you have any talents. And if they offer you suggestions as to talents that they see in you, don't just say, that can't be right. Consider it. And really examine yourself on it. Put it to the test. See if it's true. You know, maybe some of them see talents in you that um, are there but not fully developed yet. Well, then develop that talent. I mean, there's always to deal with this sort of thing, right? So just don't take that attitude that there's nothing you can do and that God doesn't um, consider your contributions of any consequence because every contribution matters. So let's read on.
Men in this church must feel that God wishes them to become laborers in his cause in any capacity. Unless they change their course, some will be found in a position similar to that of the Pharisees when Christ addressed them, quote, The publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you, end quote. Many feel secure because they profess the truth, while they do not feel its sanctifying influence upon their hearts and do not advance in the divine life. Don't feel secure in your experience just because you know a lot of truth. Are you advancing in the divine life? Sanctification is a life of continual advancement. So if you're not advancing, you are retrograding. Don't feel satisfied. You know, that's a comfortable position. That's a lukewarm state. You want to be uncomfortable. You want to be motivated to do something. Don't feel comfortable with your attainments and your status or your position or your knowledge. We should all be growing in uh, knowledge and experience and advancing in the divine life. Brethren, while you as a people profess to have light far in advance of other denominations, your works do not correspond with your profession. Many who have been in the darkness of error gladly accept the truth when it is opened to their understanding. Although they have spent their life in sin, yet when they come to God in penitence and with a sense of their sinfulness, they are accepted of him. Such persons are in a more favorable position for the perfection of Christian character than are those who have had great light and have failed to improve upon it. That which leaves men and women in darkness is their neglect to improve the light and opportunities granted them. Christ hates all vain pretense. When on earth he ever treated with tenderness the penitent, even though they had been the chief of sinners, but his denunciations fell heavily upon all hypocrisy. Okay, so let's examine this paragraph a little bit too. Let's break it down bit by bit. So she's really counseling, and remember these testimonies are written to the Advent believers. So she's telling them, you know, hey, you believe that you have a lot of light far in advance of the other denominations, but your works don't correspond with your profession. And she contrasts that with people who, when, you know, they've lived their whole life in sin, maybe. And then when they have an opportunity to hear the truth, they readily accept it and they make that transformation. They come in penitence to God. They admit that they're a sinner and that they need salvation, that they need to change. They realize that they're in need of everything that God has to offer them. They don't consider themselves rich and increased with goods and in need of nothing. They recognize their need. So in other words, they're not the Laodicean. They're not in a Laodicean state. However, the Adventist church is told that we are in a Laodicean state so long as we hold to that idea that we don't really need anything beyond what we have right now. These people that recognize their need are in a more favorable position for the perfection of Christian character than are those who have had great light and have failed to improve upon it. Now that's really important, that phrase, for the perfection of Christian character. What are they in a uh, more favorable position to do or to obtain? They're in a more favorable position to advance in the divine life to obtain that perfection in Christian character. It's not that they're just supposed to say, oh, now I know more, I'm done. No, they are to advance and to obtain perfection in Christian character. That's what we're all supposed to do. We can't have one cherished sin in the life and expect to be restored with the company of sinless beings. That's what cause the fall in the first place is that um, idea that a little bit of disobedience is okay. One little sin is okay. It's not. And so long as we have the idea in our mind that it is okay, we'll be satisfied with where we are. We will never reach 
for that goal of obtaining uh, perfection in Christian character and thus will remain a Laodicean. She goes on to say that that which leaves men and women in darkness, okay, this is really important, that which leaves men and women in darkness is their neglect to improve the light. So in the understanding of truth, the knowledge of truth, the revelation of truth, their neglect to improve the light and opportunities granted them. So have you had light offered to you and you've rejected it? Have you decided that you know everything there is to know? Have you decided, I know my Bible and you can't teach me anything? Really, is that the way we are to think? That's not the counsel. It's certainly never found anywhere in Scripture that once you know X, Y, Z, you're done. We are always to be growing in grace and knowledge of the truth. Christ hates all vain pretense. When on earth he ever treated with tenderness the penitent, so those who are truly repentant, those who truly are sorry for their sins, who recognize that it is wrong and aren't satisfied to remain in that sin. Even if they've been the chief of sinners, so long as there's penitence, there is acceptance with Christ. But the hypocrisy, that's where the denunciations fell most heavily. And it's the same thing today. God has given to every man his work, and no one else can do that work for him. I'm just going to pause there. No one else can do your work. Every man has a work. Not everyone's work is the same, but you have whatever work you have been given to do. That may be more or less than another person. We're not all required to do exactly the same amount of labor even. Not only is it not supposed to all look the same, there's also limitations for certain people and they can't do as much as the next. And those who are able to do more are held to a higher standard. Oh, that you individually would apply the ISAV that you might see your defects of character and realize how God regards your love of the world, which is crowding out the love of God. So this is an individual case. Salvation is an individual process. You have to apply the ISAB for yourself. I have to apply ISAB for myself. Every person has their own work of reformation to do. Nothing can give you such power, such true self-reliance and nobility of soul as a sense of the dignity of your work, an assurance that you are co-laborers with God in doing good and saving souls. Recognizing the importance of the work that we have been given will give you that power. It will give you that nobility of soul. And it will have a transforming influence on your own Christian experience. The Son of God came to this world to leave an example of a perfect life. Now some people think Christ came just to die. He came just to die for us so we wouldn't have to die. But what good would that really do if that's all it was? Just come and die because somebody had to die. Right? That doesn't make any sense, and people in the world recognize that. You know, people who don't believe in Christ as the Son of God, who don't believe in religion or Christianity in, in particular, you know, they recognize that that doesn't make any sense. Oh, God just had to have somebody die, so Jesus decided, oh yeah, I'll give my life, and that saves us? No. What saves us is his life that he lived, one of overcoming sin, and he did that as an example for us to show us how we can overcome sin so that we can be partakers of the divine nature and that we can just have a, a transforming influence on the world that we can help hasten the end of sin and suffering. So I'm going to read that again. The Son of God came to this world to leave an example of a perfect life. He sacrificed himself for the joy that was set before him, the joy of seeing souls rescued from Satan's grasp and saved in the kingdom of God. Now notice, his joy wasn't that, oh, now they don't have to die because I died in their place. 
His joy was in knowing that by his example, the life of victory over sin that he lived, that he's going to rescue other people from Satan's grasp. Souls will be rescued from Satan's grasp and saved in the kingdom of God. That's exciting. It's not exciting to think, oh, you know, well, I'm just doomed to continue sinning and um, feeling that guilt that comes along with knowing that I've done something wrong, knowing that I've been unkind or unloving to someone. That's not encouraging. What's encouraging and what's exciting is that we don't have to be that way, even now, because Christ came as a human being in sinful flesh. That doesn't mean that he was a sinner. Sinful flesh doesn't mean that a person chooses to sin. It means that we have bodies that have been affected by sin. We degenerate, we have illness, we have fatigue and confusion and, and limitations. And he had the same body and temptations that we have. And yet he was able to overcome sin by uniting with the divine power offered through the truth through the impartation of the messages given by the Holy Spirit. That's our hope, that's our salvation, that's the encouragement that we have. And that's why we should not be satisfied to remain undecided. There's every reason to make a choice. And so I wanna encourage every one of you to do that. <laughs>